Got a love about that bunch, church, that people love to worship and love the fellowship. Isn't that, isn't that exciting? Isn't it exciting thing when people get together and just like to fellowship and love people and love on people and to, and to just experience who they are and what God has for them? It's exciting. It really is. Good morning. Good to have you folks here with us. It's good to have you here at Mercy Point Governor. I want to say, of course, thank you and welcome to our people that join us online each and every week. Even if this is the first week that you've joined us, you are in a special, special place. You are here with us, and that's what counts. And all of you, I'm glad to have you here with us, of course, here uh, in the sanctuary this morning. Uh, a couple things I do remind you every week. I remind us every week. Matter of fact, I did it this morning. I went into my uh, wall and checked in. I checked in at Mercy Point Governor, and I would encourage you to do it too as well. And number two, also when we post the video, and these are for our friends also online too, share this with people who need to hear this. This is important. People need to hear the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And we would encourage you to share the video with them so they can experience it too as well, all right? Uh, a couple things I wanna mention to you is, for those who were here this past Tuesday night, did you have a great time in prayer and worship? Yeah. It was exciting. So, if you didn't have a chance to be here, you still have an opportunity. Every Tuesday night, beginning at 6.30 p.m., right here in the sanctuary at Mercy Point Governor, we get together to pray. To pray and believe and ask God to see his mighty touch in this community, in this church, in this area. And we would encourage you to be here. Again, that's Tuesday nights, beginning 6.30. We try to go about an hour or so. We, last, uh, this, the first one, we ran about eight or so. But, you know, nevertheless, we try to get out of here as quickly as possible. Because we know people have schedules and commitments, what have you. So if you can be here, we'd love to have you here. That's item number one. Item number two. Coming up in the month of January. And I want you to go ahead and write this on your calendar. This would be starting on... January, February 3rd, it runs till Sat uh, Sunday the 10th. Sunday, January 3rd, Sunday, January 10th. This is the first full week in the month of January. And this is where we set aside as a network of churches here from Mercy Point, the Mercy Point Church, get together to pray and to fast and believe to see what God is gonna do amongst our churches. And I would ask you that you would be a part of that Participate by praying. There are numerous ways you can fast. Uh, there are a number, number of ways out there. We can also put information on that if you need it. Um, but definitely take some time, some concentrated time away to pray and ask God to see what he wants to do. Not only in this church, but all of our churches. And there will be some other plans that will be coming forward. More details on that to come. But keep those dates in the back of your mind. Again, the first full week in the month of January 2021. Let's start off the year correctly, right? Let's start the year right by spending time fasting and praying, amen? In Philippians chapter one, verse six, uh, there was a word that I wanted to share this morning with you that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, it's a verse that I've always kind of looked at, but also it's a, a verse that I've always kind of, um, I would say, I haven't really looked at it that much as the way I read it in a couple translations this past week. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, and I'll read it from, uh, this translation is called the voice transla trans uh, transla translation, the voice translation, and it says, I am confident that the Creator, who has begun such a great work among you, will not stop in mid-design, keep that in mind there, mid-design, but will keep perfecting you until the day Jesus, the anointed, our liberating king, returns to redeem the world. He has not stopped in mid-design. He has not stopped doing the work that he wants to do. I'm going to speak this out prophetically this morning, and I speak this to my friends online. God is not done with you. Thank you, Jesus. God is not done with each one of you here in the sanctuary. God is going to continue to do the work that he wants to do. Regardless if you're 770 or 170, the point being is God is still working his work through you. And he wants to complete it. 
I know there are people out there who feel discouraged, who feel whatever's going on, but I'm here to reassure you today that God wants to complete his good work in you. You're not within this stream. You're not an accident. You're not anything that God didn't create. You were created by God and are going to be used by God for his glory and his honor. And if you look at it also, there's one more translation I want to read this morning to you. And that actually was out of the, um, it was actually out of the Amplified translation of the Bible. And this is what actually it says. If I can get my Amplified translation of the Bible working on here. All right. Anyway, the Amplified translation of the uh, translation of the Bible this morning says in verse 6, I am convinced and sure of this very thing. I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up until the time of his return, developing that good work and perfecting and bringing it to full completion in you. God wants to complete his good work in you. Don't hold back. Don't think that God has not interested in you. God has a plan for each one of us, and he wants to complete his good work as long as we are willing to allow him to work within us. It's a two-way street. We have to be willing. We have to allow the Spirit of God to come in us and to work. And then we have to be willing for him to do what he wants to do. And he does. We just have to be willing to loosen it up and let go. God has a plan for each one of us, including you online. He has a plan for each one of us. And I want you to go and discover the plan that he has for you. Amen. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you again, Father, for your working in our lives. I thank you, Father. There's that old, that little old song that says, he's still working on me the way that he wants me to be. Father, you're still working on us. You're still working on us to create us into the person that you want us to be. Father, I love you. We worship you, Father, Lord. I proclaim this prophetic truth unto our people today, Lord, that God is still doing his good plan and he is going to complete his plan regardless of what he thinks, Lord. He is going to complete it fully in the day of Jesus. In your name we worship you, we praise you, we give you hallelujah. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, if you stand up with us this morning, something about unity, you know, when we stand together, it demonstrates the willingness of our heart to be unified body of Christ, and even if it's just for a little bit, we're still united, right? The scripture tells us to pray at all times in the spirit, so let's just pray in the spirit this morning for a little while. Yeah. 
them to have it. I don't know if you can, I don't, I don't know if you can, uh, if you're like, no, please, no. <laughs> uh, one day in the future, maybe today, we'll be gathered together in the presence of the Lord, every tongue and tribe and nation. Heavenly instruments of all kinds, voices, lives, giving glory to Jesus Christ, the Son. We'll praise God there in His presence. Today we're commanded to praise Him, sometimes in the misery sometimes in the difficulty, sometimes in the hard times.
declaration. It's you standing with the faith that God has put in your heart saying, you know what? I don't care what comes my way. I'm going to praise God. I don't care if I stayed up too late last night. I don't care if I hit a deer on the way to church this morning with my car. I don't care what comes at me. I'm going to praise the Lord. On this side of heaven is the only place where we offer a sacrifice like that. Yes. To praise God in the middle of the storm. Because once we're with God on the other side, no more storm.
bent over with my arm all the way down in the rocks with the water swishing past my ear because I couldn't see it was brown water with an eight-year-old girl that was crying and a bunch of kids and my wife and we had all prayed and asked the Lord to show us where those glasses fell in the water and as I went out there I'm feeling around the rocks and I feel a hole in between the rocks and I pulled my hand back because I didn't know what was in the hole. I'm on a snapping turtle or something like that and I stick my hand in its mouth. And I looked everywhere I could around that hole. The sun was setting, it was getting dark. And the Holy Spirit said, if you don't stick your hand in that hole, you're never gonna know whether those glasses were in there. And so, reluctantly, but earnestly, I stuck my hand in there, right where God had put the glasses, pulled them out of the river, beyond all hope of finding. The other time was when we were considering moving from one church to another. And I sat with a pastor who was a good friend of ours. We, we, had been, we, we had agreed to stay at their church as worship leaders for six months. And we ended up being there for two and a half years. But the Holy Spirit was showing us it was time to move on. And when we talked to him, he said, if you don't go, you'll never know if it was God. to say this, if you're sitting in the church and God's putting a word in your heart to encourage people but you hold it in and you don't share it you will never know if it was God because it was about us, it's about what the Lord is doing, right? But we say thank you. Thank you for stepping out and being brave. <laughs> That's awesome. I just, I just really feel the Lord speaking to us about courage. You guys can be seated. Thank you. You guys that are still standing at the end of that, you're Jesus freaks. I want you to know that. <laughs> and the rest of the Jesus freaks in the room that, that are older and tired, they're still standing up on the inside. Amen. Amen. You're like those, you're, you're like those little kids, man. You're, you, your parents can make you sit down, but inside you're still standing up, right? That's the way it works. Glory to God. How many of you can attest to the good things God has done for you today? Can I just see your hands 
throw them out like a hello in praise to Jesus. Just throw those hands up. Lord, we just thank you that every good and perfect gift comes from you, Father. Lord, I thank you that no matter what we need, you are always working on our behalf. And in your perfect timing, you always come through when we trust in you. So we want to take this moment to give back to you, Father. Whether we put cash in an envelope to put in the offering box in the back when we go by, they write a check, or if we text to the number 77977, the word Mercy Point Church, and we give online. God, we give back to you that which is already yours, trusting that you will take what is left for us and do abundantly above more than we could ask or think. Because God, you are faithful and your promises are true and you show that over and over and over again. The Lord's really been putting this song in my heart a lot lately and then David played it in the house yesterday and this morning when we were like, What's another song that we can just put on the list just in case? And the name of the song is New Wine. And I just want to read you the words. We're going to be singing this, I think. I have a feeling that we're going to sing it quite a bit in this coming season. But the chorus goes, Make me your vessel. Make me an offering. Make me whatever you want me to be. I come here before, I come here with nothing, but all you have given me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. And the bridge goes, because where there is new wine, there is new power. There is new freedom, and the kingdom is here. I lay down my old flames to carry your new fire today. The Father is always doing new things. And we can never truly be ablaze if we try to hold on to the old things. I know for one me, I hate change. <laughs> I really struggle with change. But as I mature in Christ and my identity becomes more and more like his and my faith just ever increases, that becomes less and less of an issue. So God, today, as we've given in the natural that you could do the work in this house, God, we surrender afresh and give ourselves as an offering that you would use us as you would will and have your way, God. Yes, Jesus. Make us new vessels to carry your new wine, that we would be ablaze with a new fire of what you're doing. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. came to Jesus a while ago, I had in my mind what a move of the Holy Spirit looks like. Because it was, if you watch that movie, uh, oh, with the, with the rabbit, little rabbit, come up, what was that? Zootopia. Zootopia. Yeah. Yeah. Revival was in my dunna. It's in my DNA. <laughs> and if you were born again in the presence of Jesus, revival is in your DNA too. Mm -hmm. 
different places we've been privileged to go, other brothers and sisters we've been honored to serve with, we've gotten to see our share of what we call revival. Where God takes something that's dead or struggling to live and he brings it back to life. This week in March 4th, we were looking at Isaiah chapters 21 through 27. And in the New Testament, we were in Ephesians chapter 6 and Philippians 1 and 2. Back 25 years ago, I assumed that the, the move of the Holy Spirit, Spirit was always spontaneous. But a David Tanner that's uh, 30 years older now understands that the Holy Spirit is also in the planned and the orchestrated if we invite him in on the planet and the orchestrated. So when Jesus read in the temple, Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he declared at the end of that, of that passage that that, that that scripture was fulfilled in their hearing, if you read closely in that little piece of scripture there, it says that he was Reading as was his custom. They had a schedule. And I was like, oh, Jesus had a schedule. <laughs> it was his turn? It was his turn? They predetermined that it was his turn to read? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. And what he said made everybody so mad they wanted to kill him. I don't think that'll happen today, but I could be wrong. <laughs> so as I'm praying, you know, I have an incredible appreciation for people who can grab a hold of something and they are like a laser focused on that one thing. But my brain doesn't work like that. As I'm reading through the word of God, he's taking all these pieces and he's saying, take this and take this and take this and take this and take this. And I'm going to show you how they go together. Today we're going to talk about praying for the salvation of lost people. I don't think I have to convince you that God moved his people to pray. The timing of our prayer meeting this week was ordained of the Lord. The timing, timing of the network fast coming up is ordained of the Lord. And while it won't look the way it has in the last couple of years, we're convinced that it's going to be better and more fruitful. James 5.16 says, the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's old King James. New Living Translation, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. And so when I was praying about this, I, was, I looked at it and I said, okay, we're going to call today's message Power and Effect. I don't like to call people lost, but if you look at it that way, basically, we would look at people and we would say, okay, this person knows Jesus, this person doesn't. And therefore, anybody that doesn't know Jesus is considered lost. Right? It's a simple oversimplification. How many of you guys have met people in your life where you're scratching your head going, I don't know if they know the Lord or not? Are they lost or are they saved? That's between God and them. But what are we called to do? Share the gospel. Love people. Pray for them. Do everything we can, if it's humanly possible with us, to lead people into an encounter with his presence. Because in his presence, God can do more than what we can do. So the thought I'm thinking of today is that the power of God in us will produce heavenly effects wherever our faith is aimed. 
The power of God in us, His Holy Spirit, will produce heavenly effects wherever our faith is aimed. So if we're in a prayer meeting and we're lifting up lost people, people we know that are struggling, people we know that need Jesus, the power of God at work in us is going to be aimed towards them. And it's going to start to work in their life. Why? Why bother? People want to be lost, let them be lost. We got Jesus, we're good, right? I believe in Jesus, I'm going to heaven. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 and 9, or 6 through 9, actually. This tells us a little bit of what we've got to look forward to. All through Scripture in the Old Testament, you want to know why you read the Old Testament? Because there's little pieces in there that show you your future. The last time somebody asked me, hey, Tanner, you want to hear your horoscope? I said, no, my future is written in the Word of God. I don't need that. God has already told me who I am and my final destination, and that he's going to walk with me from point A to point B. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth, He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and his people. The Lord has spoken. You know, it leads to a declaration in verse 9. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we've trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. All of the people that experience this good time that God has have experienced his salvation. Why does it matter that we go and we pray for lost people and, and share the gospel? Because we get to experience those good things that God has prepared for all people. And to fail to do our part in the prayer closet or out there in the world is to selfishly hold on to something that was meant to be shared to everybody. Our final reward Because Jesus saved us, we have a glorious destiny ahead of us. But it was planned for everybody. What's God's mission on the earth? Does anybody know? You could probably name a lot of things. The Bible doesn't contain the history of the earth. For scientists to go and argue about creation and origins and things like that. Well, it contains details and pieces. But let me throw something else your way. The Bible contains the birth, the growth, and the future of the kingdom of heaven on earth. The whole thing from front to be from from the very first page all the way to the end is about God bringing people into heaven throughout the ages. So what's God's mission? He told it to Abraham, I'm going to bless the nations of the earth through your seed. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he said it to Isaac and Jacob as well. Later on, he would say it to prophets. Jesus would declare it himself. And in the re- in Revelation, in the end, you see finally all the nations of the earth are gathered together. And the angels declare finally the kingdoms of the earth are now the kingdoms of our God. 
He's moving to bless the nations of the earth, and he's going to use us to do it. God's mission. 2 Peter 3, 9. It says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want people to die and go to hell. He wants people to be with him in heaven. He wants people to know him now. Well, if God wants everybody to be saved, and he wants to use us to do it, then why in the world aren't there thousands of people coming into the kingdom around you and around me? If you're around me any length of time, you know that I don't like to give any credit to the enemy. But at the same time, I don't want you to deny the fact that he exists. That's right. Our challenge is to always keep our thoughts and our words magnifying the Lord, not the enemy. Because when you start to magnify the enemy, everything gets out of whack. You forget your mission, and now you're off on a tangent. You know, you see what I'm saying? There are some songs I will not play in church because I believe that it's devil worship, literally. <laughs> not that any Christian would ever suggest that, but here's the way it goes. If you've got a song that sings all about the devil and what you're going to do to him, I can't do that. I can't process it. This is where God gets glorified. This is where God gets lifted up. This is where Jesus gets magnified. I'm not giving the creep a place. And I say that with the most respect that I can. Because we know that the devil is older and more powerful than any of us. That's why we need Jesus to save us. So why is it that thousands and thousands of people aren't coming to God around us? Well, we're in a war. Did you know that? Did you know you're in a war? If you have Jesus Christ, you and I are a soldier in the army of God, in a war being waged for the souls of men and women around this world. Yes. I'm going to read you something out of Isaiah 22. Maybe you'll see yourself in this. I know I did. You see, we have a real tendency sometimes... <laughs> like the jokes about men in direct directions, right? You open up a box with this brand new widget and you're going to put it together, but you don't need the instructions. You just start putting it together. And then it doesn't fit right, or you break something, or you've got pieces left over and you're scratching your head and going, huh? And then you go back to the directions. People generally will try everything. Everything. And then sit in a broken mess and finally go, God, I need help. Come on, don't laugh at me like I'm the only one that does it. I've lost count of how many times we prayed for God to return things that were lost. But I do know that the cumulative effect of that was that now anytime somebody comes and says I've lost something that was important to me, I go to God first. Because I have 100% faith that God is going to return that thing. I don't know why. He just demonstrated it over and over and over again. The evidence is, the pile is so big that I can't believe anything else other than God will return it. I don't care what, what circumstance you lost it under. Beyond all hope, he's going to return that thing. The point is, ask God for help first. When I read this, it's Isaiah chapter 22. And uh, you know, let's start in... Isaiah is giving a, a word of prophecy to the Israelites about Jerusalem, and it's really about, you know, their, God coming and purging them from sin. In verse 8, he says, Judah's defenses, Judah, the tribe of Judah, the southern kingdom, <clears throat> have been stripped away. You run to the armory for your weapons. You inspect the breaks in the walls of Jerusalem. You store up water in the lower pool. You survey the houses and tear some down for stone to strengthen the walls. Between the city walls, you build a reservoir 
for water from the old pool. They're doing everything they can to prepare themselves for an attack that they know is coming. I thought that was kind of funny there. You know, you tear down old houses to, strength, to get stones to strengthen, uh, strengthen your walls. I'm like, wow, talk about robbing Peter to pay Paul. The end of verse 11, but you never ask for help from the one who did all this. You never considered the one who planned this long ago. Scripture would tell us that God will orchestrate the rise and fall of nations in the hopes that in the darkness we would reach out and grab a hold of him. Why? Because, well, when things are going great, what do we do? We walk away. We wander. So in understanding that we're in a war... And understanding that there are angels, there are demons in a supernatural conflict around us. We don't want to enter into it without knowing that the presence of the Lord is in us and with us. That's why we've waited so long to have a prayer meeting. We started praying about that in February or March for this house, even though we weren't here. Because I've seen it with my own eyes. You can have a church that has nobody in there. Their worship team is terrible. Everything looks like it's falling apart. But there's a core of people that are meeting and lifting the house up and praying that God will continue to use them. And, they're, and you look at the money that comes into that place and the money they're sending out to send missionaries to other lands. God has blessed them. But you would look at the people and you would say, how does that happen? The numbers don't add up. God's math doesn't add up, but there's people in the secret place hammering the enemy in prayer. Maybe on the outside, everything isn't going that great for your church, but guess what? When people gather together in prayer, God starts something rolling. And the power of God starts to work in us and produce heavenly effects as we're aiming our faith at certain things. It's very important that we understand who our enemy is. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. I'm going to pull this up in the message because I read a lot of translations, but I was like, whew, that's, um, huh, that's... That's an eye-opener there. He's talking about prayer. He's talking about putting on the armor of God. He's talking about standing strong against the enemy. Listen to what he says. This is Paul, and it's coming from the message. And that about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so that you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we will walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon that God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you still will be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Amen. You see why I picked that? <laughs> If it's not plain enough, in the shorter translations with less words, it would say that we're fighting against spiritual forces of darkness, not flesh and blood. As much as we don't like it, Nancy Pelosi is not our enemy. Yep. Jesus died for Nancy. 
just like he died for you and me. And he loves her just as passionately as he loves you and me. Both sides of this political issue that's going on in our country right now, I, and you, all you got to do is read Ephesians chapter 6. You're being, we're being played yes. by demonic forces. Yes. Back up and look at what God is saying. We're in a war for people's souls. Never forget that. That is the objective. That is the goal. If we take our eyes off of it, People don't make it. Arm yourself. Hmm. Hey, I got any children that want to volunteer to hold some string for me? If they do, they can come on up. Andres, you want to help? Van, girls, Corbin? Anybody want to help? I'll take a volunteer if you want to come on. Let's entertain a what if, okay? Just, just stay with me here for a little bit. You want to help? Come on up, girls. You take that. Let me put this on because I got people coming in my circle. I got to put this on because you guys are in my circle. All right, here, well, this is what we're gonna do. You take the ball, and you go all the way back there. Can you, can you unroll it when you go, so it comes out? There you go. You hold on to your end tight, Andres. You stay right there, don't move. Go ahead, go ahead, you can, oh, you know what? You stay here with me, we're gonna do something special. Go ahead, keep going. Go all the way back to mommy. Take it all the way back to mommy. Come over here, Andres. Oh, I said hold it tight. <laughs> Andres, you got to hold that string with earnesty, man. <laughs> Put some force on that thing. Hold it like you mean it. Pray like you mean it. All right. Anybody ever hear the scripture, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, a thousand years is as a day. Yes. Just because I'm a geek, you know how to carry scissors? You carry him with the point down, okay? Keep the point down, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna go cut that thing right in the middle. You wanna do that? Come on, we'll go cut that thing. So just because I'm a geek, one day I was doing math. Let's try, let's try right about here. Go ahead, go ahead and cut, open it up. Go ahead and close it. Now you don't have the skill with scissors, you kinda have to Now, thanks for your help. If you take a thousand years and you divide it in half, what do you get? Hold on, Andres. We're not done. You get 500 years, right? Yes. If you take a day and divide it in half, what do you get? 12 hours. 12 hours, right? Yeah. You hold on to both ends. You got them? You hold on to them with earnesty? You got it? All right. 500 years divided in half, what, 250? Yes. 250. Okay. Hold on those ones. 250 divided in half? 125. 125. And let me do this. If I keep my feet, let go of the, let go of the, there. Okay, you hold that. If we keep going down like this. 62 and a half. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yeah, that ends. Yep, you got it. We keep going down like this and dividing everything in half. Eventually, this gets really small, right? I think it's a small one we're going to go. Yeah, you can try more if you do. You're going to cut a finger. I don't want to cut my finger or yours. Thanks for helping me with that, too. You take it with you. It's your present. (laughs) 
There's a reason I did that. If you keep dividing the one day, and you keep dividing the thousand years, and you keep going down, eventually you get to something like this. Five seconds with the Lord equals 21 days. Give or take. I round it in there once in a while. Five seconds, almost 21 days, three weeks. I've heard people say that the Lord can do more in a moment in his presence with him in your life than a lifetime of instruction classes and teachings and other things. One moment in the presence of God, he could break something or undo something or plant something or cause something to grow that would have taken a lifetime to cultivate on your own. So can we agree that the presence of the Lord is powerful? When I looked at that scripture and I related it to the presence of the Lord affecting earthly things, God affecting earth in prayer, what if something as little as five seconds could bring an impact of heaven in God's will on a person's life for up to three weeks? It's just, yeah. me, it's just me being a geek, right? I'm not saying this is the word of the Lord. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is the presence of God is powerful. And we do not understand that when we take a simple moment and say, I got a friend named Ron. Jesus, please save Ron. Two seconds. That it might just be that the angels hear that, that God hears that, he dispatches those forces, and they go and start doing work in that person's life. That five seconds might have bought that person another two weeks and a chance to apprehend the grace of God. Yes. And a chance just for a moment for the demonic to be pushed back as that war comes over them and all of a sudden they can hear and perceive the gospel for the first time in their life, maybe. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm not saying the string is the word of the Lord. But I'm saying that when God says our prayer is powerful and effective, he wasn't lying. We don't understand. We don't understand because we don't see it instantly with our natural eyes. But when he moves a church to pray, and don't think for a second this Tuesday was nothing. The leadership of this house gathered together to pray as a unit, as a team, for the first time since we've been here, in a way that I feel is really significant, God started a ball moving. <clears throat> so you arm yourself with the presence of the Lord. He is a weapon. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not your neighbor who who dumps his trash on your driveway. It's the demonic things that people agree with that lead them on a path away from the Lord. That is the enemy. Those unseen things that are controlling and dominating over regions, those are the enemy. I don't claim to have great knowledge about this stuff. I only know what I read in the Bible. We already said James 5.16 says that, that the prayers of a righteous person are, avail much or, or the, prayer, the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. This is what I found in Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 this week. What may be the most powerful weapon that you have as far as you wouldn't, you wouldn't think of this. The presence of the Lord is going to work his kingdom and work. I, I, there was, the Lord said one time, when you pray for me to come, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring my kingdom with me. But there are some things you look at and you're like, that's a, that's a weapon? Yeah. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. 
I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, a righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. A righteous character produced in our life by Jesus Christ is what brings God much glory and praise. And I want to say it probably is the one thing that we don't think has much of an effect on anybody else. You see, we want to go and we want to try so many different things. We got, a, we got this program we're going to try and we're going to do an outreach and we're going to go and we're going to reach governor for the, for the Lord and uh, we're going to you know, give away this thing or that thing or we're going to perform this service or that or we're going to do this, this program or have this event and, and the whole city is going to come and get saved. Well, maybe what the Holy Spirit is saying, no, how about you just live a pure and blameless life? And let the righteousness that Christ purchased for you grow and cultivate it in your life. If you want to see the power of God come and save people, then make the Lord holy in your life. Make your home a habitation for His presence. Let your mind be renewed by His Spirit. Start to look around and say, God, what's in my house that needs to go so that more of your presence can be here so that when people come near me, they feel your presence. They feel your love. They feel your forgiveness. They feel your mercy. But they also feel your power and your righteousness. That they would be compelled to ask questions. Questions that give you an opportunity to explain boldly what it is that Jesus has done for you. And that he would do the same thing for other people. What you don't need. Apathy. If you look at Ephesians 6.10, it says, Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. God is a force. I've heard people say God's a gentleman. He is. But he is also a force. If you don't believe it, just try to imagine for a second what happens when sin, when let's just talk about a lie, a deception, comes in contact with the truth of, of who God is, his presence. Imagine what that conflict, that contact looks like. In God's presence, there can be no sin. Jesus had to come to put a buffer between us and the wrath of God. Not because God didn't want us in his presence, but because sin prevents it. Anybody ever throw chicken wings in a hot grease pan when they were frozen? That is a violent reaction, okay? It's probably way worse than that when God's presence comes in contact with sin. So when I say that he's forced, it's only to compare it to, you don't need apathy, let it go. This season in our country has led us to a season of apathy. Oh, just go with anything, you know, so we just flow along and blah, blah, blah. No. Could it be for just a second, could it be that God stripped away everything in this country to return his church to what makes us most powerful and effective? Prayer, gathering together to pray for people that they would come into his kingdom, that they would receive his grace. Could it be that everything in our lives has been put on hold and paused, not because evil governors have tried to take away everything from us, but because God himself has said, 
all things work together for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. So even this is going to work together for your good. Yeah, there might have been evil that motivated it, and there might have been evil trying to use it for all sorts of things, but God's purpose is greater. God is stronger. God's will is bigger, and if he's desiring for his church to grow and thrive through this, which I believe he is, how are we going to respond? The other thing, what you don't need, there's a scripture that says, judge not that you not be judged. This has paralyzed the church. And that dude's life that's out of place, God. And you know that God disapproves, so you begin to pray. That is righteous judgment. That is you looking at a situation with the discernment and the Holy Spirit that God has given you saying, God, I'm going to my knees for this person. Now, a better application, I think, would be um, because the same measure you use to judge others, it's going to be turned back to you, right? Please, judge me. Because I can guarantee you what you get from me is if I see something out of order in your life, I talk to Jesus about you. And with the same measure that I dish it out, I would like you to return it. Because I don't really need sometime, well maybe once in a while I need somebody to tell me my issue. But what I really need is a few moments in the presence of God for, he, for him to fix my issue. That's what I need. And I hope that you pray for me as much as I pray for you. Matter of fact, when I see a deficit, I want to invest more time, okay, using my godly judgment to pray better things for you guys. And I pray that that gets pressed down, shaken together, and turned back my way. I don't have a problem with godly people judging me. You know why? Because like King David said, there's something about the mercy of the godly. There's something about the mercy of the godly. That's what we really want. So what does victory look like? This is taken right out of Isaiah. Strong cities, evidence of God's salvation everywhere, righteous and fruitful people in abundance, peace, and people living God-centered lives. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that, you know, with whatever the Assemblies of God believes about the end times isn't true. I'm not going there at all. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that when you pray, God's power is bringing heavenly things and causing an effect. And that effect, according to Scripture, should be strong cities, people being saved, people living righteously. Those are the things we have a right to expect because we're crying out to God to bring those things. And in faith, we're looking for it to happen. How will we know that it's happening? How will we know we've got victory when you start seeing it happen? Um, baby, I've got no cards and, and pens. Would, would you, and there's gloves right there. Do you mind passing them out to everybody? Heather's gonna give you a pen and a note card. When you get it, because the Holy Spirit's been speaking less instruction, more demonstration. When you get the pen, just ask the Lord a simple question. Lord, who around me is lost? It's very simple. Who around me is lost? I write their names down on the card. No, I'm not going to put them on a mailing list or anything like that. Write as many as you can until we, until we stop. We put up the slide that says objective number one. These are things as we were reading scripture that popped up uh, for prayer. And so at this point, I just want to, I want to move into a, a time of prayer real quick. Um, but I want to declare these things. So, because these are scriptural. This is, this is what God wants of us. He wants it to grow. 
And yeah, there's grace. He covers everything in between. We can focus on one thing and God covers everything else, right? But whatever, we, whatever God pinpoints, we need to work on it. Because that's how he works. He points at something to us and he says, I want you to work on this. And he covers everything else. And then he helps you walk through that thing. Objective number one, that God would teach us to pray in the spirit at all times, on every occasion, with alertness and with persistence. Heavenly Father, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray in the Spirit. Teach us to pray at all times, on every occasion. Teach us to be alert and persistent in our prayer. Objective number two. Father, teach us to be fearless in confessing our weaknesses to our brethren that we might learn to pray to powerful heavenly effect. You see that scripture about the prayers of a righteous person that are powerful and effective. You can't drop out the word righteous. It's the prayer of a righteous person. Now we know that Jesus makes us righteous. But there is a working of that in our lives. And part of that working of righteousness is acknowledging what's not right in here and confessing it to our brothers and sisters. Hey, I'm weak here. Can you help me? Use that godly judgment that God has given you. And lift me up to Jesus. Because I need it. Objective number three, that God would give us the right words so we can boldly explain his love and offer of salvation to everyone who will listen. Father, we want to know nobody explains your gospel perfectly. But when we step out and we, and we step out and we try, God, and we fumble and we stumble, we pray that they would hear your spirit, that they would perceive your presence despite our words or any insecurities that we have. Objective four, that the good news about Jesus would spread through every people group in our local community and beyond. God, as we pray for these individuals, let your gospel roll into these subcultures in our communities. And let other believers around us be ignited to passionate, risk-taking faith. Oh, God, let us light each other up like one candle to another. And let us encourage one another onward. And the last one, that we would truly be thankful for any help we get in our mission to see lost people saved. Yeah, the help we get might not look the way we expected it. Yeah, the church across town, the fellowship across town might not do it the way we do it. But we pray that they would be effective. We pray that many people would come into the kingdom through their work. And we pray that we would be a body that understands that it's not just us in this room. But there are believers in Jesus all across this land. I remember one time, recently, I was, I was working with a young man, and, uh, you know, we're out in the world doing our thing at, at our job, and he starts to share about, he's, he's reading the Bible now, and his words, and he opens up the Bible, and he starts to ask questions about it, and to my knowledge, I wasn't talking about the Lord. I wasn't doing anything other than living my life the way that I believe God wants me to live it. 
But as the Holy Spirit gets on this young man and he starts to testify of what God is showing him in the Bible, and we're talking, other people start to come into the circle. God starts attracting other people into this. And before you know it, you know, we had mentioned the movie God's Not Dead 3, which is a good movie. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. But this guy from nowhere goes, you mean there's a part three of those movies? Man, I got to go see that. So he leaves on his own mission from God. Another person comes in doing their work in our little circle. Next thing you know, the Holy Spirit's convicting them. They need to be in the house of God with his people. They need to be in his word. It wasn't something that we orchestrated. It was something that God did as we were just lifting up the name of Jesus in the place where we were at. So this person says, well, if I'm going to read the Bible, where should I start? So I could have answered. I looked at the, the young man who God was lighting on fire. I said, where do you think that they should start? He says, start with John. I said, that's good. Start with John. I've said it before. I'll probably say it a thousand times before I leave the earth. I hope I get the opportunity. That Jesus didn't save us just for us. He saved us also for every person that will be saved as a result of his work in us. The power of God in us will produce heavenly effects wherever our faith is aimed. You guys got some names on those cards? First of all, Father, I pray that those names on those cards will be written upon the hearts of the people who wrote them. Because those names are written on your heart. They were on your heart on the cross. They were on your heart when you endured everything. They were part of the joy that was set before you. Now I just urge you guys right where you're at, just say a simple prayer. Jesus, save and read the names. Just Jesus, save and read the names. Forgive us for every way we've stopped people from coming into the kingdom. You gave us the keys to the kingdom. You said so. Let the doors of the kingdom be open. Let people come to the kingdom. Let people receive Christ. And instead of being people who people look at and, and, and are afraid... God, let us live lives where people look and say, I need to get where they are. We can't save people, God. Only you do that. And so we're coming to you first because we want these people. there are friends or there are family or there are the people you put on our heart yeah. we commend them into your hands yes. Yes. and if the warfare is intense over their life and it takes more than this one mention to see them enter your kingdom yes. and move us with persistence remind us that we need to lift up another one of those prayers until we see it done. And we rejoice with them for the new life they found in you. 
Father, I pray a mighty blessing over all my brothers and sisters here today. Your grace is powerful. We want to see your kingdom grow, but not, but not as not as uh, bad as you do. Open our eyes to see and do more. Let your love flow through us this week to people. Let your message flow through us this week to people. Let us live pure and blameless lives in your presence. And let the light of your presence shine through. And just, you know, Mark, Mark reminded me of this a couple of times, Lord. Yes, we need to emphasize prayer. There's a whole lot of things you do without us even intending or knowing it's being done. As we're doing our part, God, you do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine. Yes. In that space. Yes. Bring more people into your kingdom. Yes. Yes. In that exceeding and abundant space, bring more people into your house. Yes. Yes. Not just here. Across the city. In Jesus' mighty name we pray today. Amen.